Hello, this is Majid from MedStudent Help. In this video, I'm going to be covering a general overview of hypercalcemia. The first thing to start with is the normal calcium level. So when we see a lab, usually we see the total calcium level in the body. Now, the total calcium level normally is between 8.6 to 10.3 milligram per deciliter, right? Now, on the other hand, we have the ionized, which means the free calcium level in the serum, which is usually between 4.4 into 5.2 milligram per deciliter. So these are the normal values of calcium. So what we know so far is that calcium, the total amount of calcium, most of it is bound to albumin, but there is a part of it that is ionized and it is in the serum, right? Now, so albumin, which is negatively charged, right, attracts and binds the positively charged electrolytes. So let's say that in this patient or in this person, we have a normal pH level. In the normal pH level, in the serum, we would find positively charged protons, right, you know, the normal amount, in addition to calcium in the serum. So this is the serum surrounding the albumin. Therefore, the albumin would bind a normal amount of calcium and a normal amount of proton, okay? Now, let's say that a patient has developed acidosis. What does acidosis mean? Acidosis means that we have so many protons in the serum. We have way too many protons in the serum that they are going to actually displace the calcium from the albumin and they are going to bind to the albumin more than calcium. So where does calcium go? Calcium is released from the albumin and it is going to be in the serum more, which means that the ionized calcium is going to increase. Okay? So in case of acidosis, albumin would rather bind protons because we have plenty of them and therefore it's going to release the calcium into the serum and the ionized calcium is going to increase. Okay, what if the patient has alkalosis? Alkalosis, right? What does alkalosis mean? Alkalosis means that the bicarbonate level is high. We're talking about metabolic one, but when the bicarbonate level is high, this means that the proton level is low, right? Okay, now when the proton level, when the proton level is low, so we have actually just few protons. So we have, let's say, only two protons bind here and the remaining of the albumin is going to be binding calcium instead right so calcium is going to be bound more into albumin this is going to decrease the level of the ionized calcium of the free calcium in the serum so so far we said that the normal calcium level is 8.6 to 10.3 this is the total amount it's divided into uh, a part of the calcium bound to the albumin and the other part is a free in the serum which is ionized right now in acidosis albumin releases the calcium therefore the ionized calcium level increases okay but in alkalosis the ionized calcium decrease because the bound calcium to albumin increases okay now let's see what actually regulates the calcium level as we know that we have four parathyroid glands, right? We have four parathyroid glands. These are present in the posterior part of the thyroid. The receptor of the parathyroid gland, so the parathyroid gland receptor, is sensitive to the calcium level in the serum. Whenever the serum calcium level decreases, decreases, this is going to stimulate this is going to stimulate the parathyroid gland. When the parathyroid gland is stimulated, they are going to produce the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone has two main targets. The first target is the bone. The second target is the kidney. Now, in the bone, what is it going to do? It is going to increase the calcium resorption, right? It is going to increase the calcium resorption which is going to be released into the serum. So the serum calcium is going to start rising. This is the first function of the parathyroid hormone. 
On the other hand, it's going to act on the kidney. On the kidney, it has two main pathways. The first one is that it's going to go and act on the tubule. In the tubule, it is going to increase the calcium reabsorption. Okay? So we're increasing the calcium reabsorption from the kidney to the serum. So we're increasing the serum calcium level. Together with the calcium, together with the calcium absorption, there is going to be some release of the phosphate or excretion of the phosphate to the tubule. Right? So this is minus 2. Okay? So the parathyroid hormone acts on the kidney. It increases the calcium absorption, calcium absorption in the tubule, and it increases the phosphate excretion. So it's going to lose some phosphate. Okay? The other function on the kidney is that it is going to activate the kidney cells that are responsible to convert the 25-hydroxy vitamin D into the 125-hydroxy vitamin D. Now, this vitamin D is the active form of vitamin D. So, where does vitamin D act? Vitamin D is going to go and act on the gut, usually the small, the small intestine, and it's going to increase the calcium absorption. It's going to increase the calcium absorption from the gut. This is one thing. What is it going to do as well? It's going to increase the phosphate absorption together with the calcium. Right? Okay. So let's see what did the parathyroid hormone do. So we had a decrease in the serum calcium level that has activated the parathyroid receptor. Parathyroid hormone was released and it acted on the uh, bone. It increased the calcium resorption, which increased the serum calcium a bit. And then it worked on the kidney. And in the kidney, it increased the calcium reabsorption from the tubule directly, which together comes with a release of phosphate to the urine. So the phosphate level was decreasing in this, in this uh, category. But on the other hand, it has activated vitamin D, which acted on the gut and increased the calcium absorption and the phosphate absorption. So it's kind of compensating for the phosphate that was released here. So the phosphate level would not really be affected that much by parathyroid hormone if everything is working perfectly. The gut, the kidney, and the intestine. All right. So what is the net result of what just happened is that the parathyroid hormone has normalized the calcium level in the serum. Okay. So now the calcium level is normal, right? Okay. So let's say that a patient came with some symptoms. What are these symptoms? Fatigue and um, complaining of constipation, constipation and kidney stone, right? Kidney stone and also some bone pain, some bone pain. Okay. So when we have the, uh, this patient, what would we do next? What would we do next? What makes sense is a CBC, right? We want to see what the hell is going on. So in this CBC, we're going to be seeing the total calcium level. We said that the total calcium level is normally between 8.6 to 10.3 milligram per deciliter. But this patient had a hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia. His calcium level was actually more than 10.3. Now, what do we do in this case? What do we do in this case is that we have to measure the parathyroid hormone level. This is the thing. We have to go and measure the parathyroid hormone level because it is the main regulator of the calcium in the body. Now, we have two possibilities. That the parathyroid hormone is actually high and it is causing the calcium to be high, right? Or the parathyroid hormone is actually low because the normalization or the elevation of the calcium level has actually suppressed the release of more parathyroid hormone. So a hypercalcemia 
would actually cause a decrease in the parathyroid uh, parathyroid hormone level if the problem wasn't really the parathyroid the parathyroid gland. Okay, so again, the patient came with the symptoms. We did a CBC. We found a hypercalcemia. After the hypercalcemia, we measured the parathyroid hormone. Let's stick to the high parathyroid hormone and high calcium. What does this mean? This means that actually the problem is in the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid glands that are present posteriorly to the thyroid gland, right, are producing so much parathyroid hormone. So much. Why is that? Why can this happen? It can happen because we have a primary, a primary hyperparathyroidism. Parathyroidism. Now, why would we have a, a, a primary hyperparathyroidism? It can be, or most likely, 80% of the cases it is an adenoma. Okay, but it can also be just a hyperplasia, a hyperplasia, hyperactivated um, cells, and it can be a cancer as well. It can be a cancer. What else can it be? It can be a part of the men syndrome. What is the men syndrome? the multiple endocrine neoplasia. If you remember, in men one syndrome, in one men one syndrome, and men two A, two A syndromes, they both involve the parathyroid gland. Now, the men one syndrome was called the three Ps, the pancreatitis and the pituitary tumor, in addition to parathyroid hyperplasia. So it involves a parathyroid hyperplasia. Okay? In men 2 a syndrome, on the other on the other hand, it is the so-called the MPH syndrome, which is the medullary medullary thyroid cancer, medullary thyroid cancer, okay, and pheochromocytoma, pheochromocytoma, in addition to hyperparathyroidism hyperparathyroidism okay so a primary hyperparathyroidism carries all of these options and we will have to investigate and see is it really an adenoma is it a hyperplasia a cancer or are there other manifestation in the body in the thyroid gland in the adrenal gland that it can be a part of the men's syndrome okay so a, a high parathyroid hormone and a high calcium level has led us into the diagnosis of a primary hyperparathyroidism. But what else can it be? It can also be the so-called familial, familial hypocalciuric, hypercalciuric, okay, whatever, hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia. What does this mean? This means that in the serum, the calcium, okay, no, so this is the urine, all right. So in the, in the serum, in the serum, the calcium is actually high. But in the urine, the calcium is low. In this one, in the familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, there is a defect in the calcium sensor that is present in the parathyroid gland, this receptor. There's a defect in this receptor that is sensing the level of the serum calcium, which is leading to kind of dysregulation, leading to high levels of calcium in the serum and low levels of calcium in the urine. In my next video, I'm going to explain the difference between how can we differentiate between the primary hyperthyroidism and the familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, and I'm going to go in details with the primary hyperthyroidism. Okay, so let's move to the other side of this chart and see. So this patient came with hypercalcemia, but when we measured the parathyroid hormone, it was low. Low parathyroid hormone and high calcium level. So this means that the problem is not actually from the parathyroid gland. Where can this calcium come from? Or where can this stimulation to the elevation of the calcium level come from? It can be something mimicking the parathyroid hormone, right? It can be something mimicking the parathyroid hormone. We call it a parathyroid hormone related peptide. So such a very like extraordinary thing, we expect 
a malignancy to be causing it, right? Because malignancies do crazy things. So a malignancy, like an adenocarcinoma, for example, of the lung or adenocarcinoma in the head and neck region or a bladder cancer, it can even be an ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, very, like very various actually uh, types of uh, tumors can be ending um, uh, producing parathyroid hormone related peptide causing symptoms of hypercalcemia because this, um, this protein is going to be elevating the calcium level and the high calcium level is going to be suppressing the parathyroid hormone leading to the low parathyroid hormone with high calcium level. Okay, this is the first thing. What is the second thing that can be causing it? It can be caused by very high vitamin D level. Now, where did this vitamin D level come from? It can be an intoxication. You know, an elderly lady has been told that her bones are not that good after being to the GP. And she refused, for example, to use bisphosphonate as the doctor recommended. But on the other hand, she decided to take vitamin D. And she's been taking too much vitamin D that actually this vitamin D has increased so much calcium reabsorption from the gut and it has uh, inhibited the parathyroid hormone leading to the, to the picture of high calcium level, low parathyroid hormone. Okay, what else? It can be also vitamin D, but it is not coming from supplements, but it is coming from the body. It is endogenous, endogenous vitamin D. What can it produce vi uh, vitamin D other than the kidney? Other than the kidney, it can be produced from, again, extraordinary thing, malignancy. What kind of malignancy can produce uh, vitamin D? Lymphoma. So lymphomas can actually lead to hypercalcemia with low parathyroid hormone, right? Because they are producing vitamin D. What else? It can be a granulomatous disease. Granulomatous disease. Like what? Most, uh, most common? Sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis can also act like lymphoma and they can be producing vitamin D and this vitamin D is going to be elevating the serum calcium level which is going to be inhibiting the parathyroid hormone and is going to give us the picture of high calcium level, low parathyroid hormone. What else? We also have another differential. This is the so-called the milk alkali syndrome. Again, we have a lady who had a bone fracture recently and after doing a bone scan she was advised to take bisphosphonate but she refused she was like no i'm gonna take calcium carbonate from the shop next to my place right this calcium carbonate this calcium carbonate supplement is actually elevating the calcium level in the serum and this calcium level is suppressing the parathyroid hormone which is leading to the picture of, again, low parathyroid hormone, high calcium level. But is there anything that we can differentiate actually between milk alkali syndrome and vitamin D endogenous and exogenous vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone related peptide? Yes, but I'm going to make a separated video for that. All right. So now we covered the big picture of hypercalcemia, right? Now, just a generalized uh, treatment protocol is usually that we need to hydrate the patient usually. We need to hydrate the patient. And after that, we give a furosemide. Furosemide, right? The diuretic to inhibit the reabsorption of electrolytes. And with the, uh, with the so much fluid excretion, calcium is going to be excreted as well. All right. So a recap of the whole video. So we spoke about how is, a hyper, how is a calcium regulated in our bodies, how the parathyroid hormone works on the bone, on the kidneys, and on the gut. And when we see a patient with a hypercalcemia, what should we think of, what diseases, and then we have to differentiate between them. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video.